ever since I was little, I was always astounded by science and technology. I would come home every day after school and watch hours upon hours of TV channels such as Discovery or National Geographic. And because I was so curious about everything, I would then research about all these topics that they would talk about and would learn about them even more. And one of these topics that just so much interested me was nanotechnology. Now, the way I got introduced into nanotechnology and my interest in nanotechnology is relatively sad to me. And this is because I got introduced to it by a way that described the apocalypse. This is probably just a flock of birds, but the apocalypse scenario is called the Grey Goo. And this is where a swarm of self-replicating nanorobo na nanorobots dismantle everything in the world, and the whole world dies, ends, done. And as you can imagine, being introduced to a topic like this is sad. No one ever wants to be introduced to something they're passionate about in such a way. And then, of course, I did more and more research, and I would learn that really the potential for nanotechnology and the potential to do good with nanotechnology is endless. For example, you can use it in, nanomedic in medicine, in material science, and much, much more. For example, uh, okay, let me just tell you this. If you take into fact that the DNA alpha helix is two nanometers in diameter, or the fact that the cell membrane of a regular cell is seven nanometers in diameter, and you take into the fact that nanotechnology deals with parameters of 100 nanometers, and often subsciences of nanotechnology, such as nanorobotics, deal in parameters of about one plus or minus one nanometer. And when you can have something that is so unbelievably small, but so small that it can also change everything the world is made of, everything we know life is made of, then you have unlimited potential. So let me start off with talking about implementation of nanotechnology into medicine. As you can see here, this is the so-called nanorobot. And what these nanorobots can do to someone is send, for example, a highly concentrated dose of antibiotics to an ar area in your body with a disease or illness, or chemotherapy medication into an area of a tumor or area infected by cancer. And this is so much better than diluting anti antibiotics or chemotherapy drugs, which is very pa painful to experience, into one circulatory system. Or they can use ultrasound, uh, ultrasound to uh, attack a tumor in one's body. Or they can use lasers and remove uh, blood clots in someone's body. Or they can help remove gout from someone's body, again, using lasers. You know, I lost my grandmother to a brain tumor when I was six. And if nanotechnology and existed back then, then she might still be alive today because you could have that ultrasound medication and, you know, she could have survived. Or at least I would have seen her in a much, much happier state than before she went passed away. As again, she, did not have to go, would, she would not have to go through the unbelievably painful uh, medication known as chemotherapy. Now, that's medicine, right? And it sounds really, really nice, because it is really, really nice. But it's sadly really, really hard to implement. And this is because of the high introductory cost. If you want something cheap, you have to have economies of scale, and sadly, that takes time to start up. So we might see nanomedicine in our lives maybe in a few decades. But something that is not that far away, and something that is already being kind of developed, is the implementation of nanotechnology in material science. Um, 
There are these things called carbon nanotubes, which you can see behind me. It's a model. And these are pretty much allotropes of carbon. And as we all know, graphite is a really, really good conductor of electricity, better than uh, copper, for example. But due to the fact that it's very, very brittle, you cannot actually use it in ele any electronic devices because it would just break. However, carbon nanotubes, the ones pictured here, are nearly 100 times stronger than steel, yet have the same conductive properties of graphite. So you could use these carbon nanotubes instead of copper wires and allow your electronics to function at a faster rate. But that's not much, as electricity is already, co copper wires are already relatively good. But the thing that carbon nanotubes excel at is the fact that they have a really nice aspect ratio. For example, if you had a carbon nanotube the uh, width of your hair, it would be up to 40 meters long. And this would be invaluable in the constant course that hum humankind has on making things smaller, on making electronic devices smaller so they could fit in everything that you would possibly fit anything into. And when you have something so small and actually allow it to be implemented into generic electronics that we use today, it will be great. It's awesome, right? Cool gadgets. But in my opinion, what's even cooler than that is using carbon nanotubes in construction projects. Um, as I said, carbon nanotubes are nearly 100 times stronger than steel. But what I didn't mention is that they have one-sixth the density of steel. So if you could replace steel parts of a structure, of, for example, the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, you could have a much lighter structure, allowing for the structure to be bigger. And tall buildings are pretty cool as well. So if you can have tall buildings using carbon nanotubes, or for example, if you could just allow buildings to be safer in, withstand, in terms of withstanding earthquakes, then carbon nanotubes could also save thousands of countless lives. And one final thing that carbon nanotubes can have in terms of the structural integrity of objects is the fact that they could be used in spaceships. Now, the only thing, in my opinion, that's cooler than tall buildings and cool gadgets is space, right? Um, who doesn't love space? It's like the final frontier. It's the coolest thing anybody could ever imagine going anywhere. But luck, sa I mean, sadly, not luckily, only a very, very minute percentage of people in the world ever get to wis visit such an awesome space part of the universe. However, carbon nanotubes could allow exactly this. Low density, 100 times stronger than steel. What, what, this is awesome. This is the future. And this is exactly what carbon nanotubes could do. Now, it's really, really nice dreaming of what could happen, how, how we will live, how we could live. But it's also important to remember of how we are living and what, what nanotechnology has exactly, uh, how nanotechnology is exactly affecting our lives today. And now to my final part, I will talk about nanotechnology and clothing. Um, the examples of where nano you can find nanotechnology in clothing today or in uh, things we use every day or most of us use every day or a very small percent percentage of people use every day is in, for example, tennis rackets, where carbon nanotubes are used to make the tennis rackets stronger so they don't break as easily and also you can have a stronger hit with them. Or, for example, allowing the air going out of a soccer, soccer ball at a much slower rate. So you can play with it longer and have less of an effect if you're playing a 90-minute game. The, the how much air, the air between the start of the game and the end of the game might vary. And the 
really, again, um, life-saving version of nano carbon nanotubes would be in body armor. There's already a company which uh, does body armor, you can see it there, AR500, or I think that's the, actually the, brand, the type of body armor that they create, but it just uses carbon nanotubes as it's 100 times stronger than steel, and it could save thousands of military men and women, or policemen and women, or anybody, in fact, who's threatened by a gunshot wound. And this is exactly what nanotechnology could do. It saves lives. It can save lives, and that's what people want at the end. They want to have their lives saved. They want to have cool buildings. They want to have cool spaceships. They want to have cool build the um, electronic devices. And when you think of it, the technological breakthroughs that the human race has been through over the past century is just, wow, it's immense, right? And imagine what we will have in a hundred years. So my generation, Generation Z, as Michael said before, will be working in industries that probably don't exist today. I'm sorry to tell the Volkswagen guy here, but you know. <laughs> um, and that is exactly what technology does. It makes the human race go further and it helps the human race um, adjust to changes in the world and it helps the human, human race improve their type of living. And I might as well be working in uh, industry, which is highly, highly focused on nanotechnology. And also, Daniel might be working in industry, which is highly, highly focused in that, that nanotechnology. Or the year 10 students in the back might be working in an industry that is highly, highly focused in nanotechnology. And this is really, in my opinion, what makes technology so interesting for all of us. It's because you have, you can imagine what will happen in 10 years, in 100 years, and that's just really cool in my opinion. So that was my TED Talk. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> Goodbye.